It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, you could find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting, uh, either through my website, emailrevealer.com, or just email me directly at oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Our archives are always free at spreaker.com. I do a live show Friday night, a solo show where I just babble on like an idiot, uh, but people seem to enjoy it. And if you go there and look up uh, Opperman, Report, Spreaker, Covert Action, uh, Jeremy Kuzmarov, you'll find our previous interview with Jeremy Kuzmarov. Now, you can find him at jeremykuzmarov.com. He's written a ton of great books, okay, that are right up our alley, okay? Obama's Unending Wars. Oh, Obama, what a great guy. (laughs) But Obama's Unending Wars. Uh, Modernizing Repression, Police Training and Nation Building in the American Century. We just had on those guys with Stop Cop City. Um, This is something we should all be concerned about. Check out Jeremy's book on the topic. Uh, The Myth of the Addicted Army. I'd love to have you come back and talk about that. Vietnam and the Modern War on Drugs. Uh, And the Russians are coming again. The first Cold War as tragedy, uh, the the second as farce. Uh, Jeremy Kuzmarov, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Yeah, man, great to have you back. And like I said, you know, any time you want to come back, I'll have you right back. Right, uh, yeah. love to discuss the, the myth of, of the addicted army sometime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because I, I, I'll tell you, dude, I'm falling for that myth, okay? So <laughs> straighten me out on that. I, I'd love to hear what the real story is on that. Um, but remind the audience, who is Jeremy uh, Kuzmarov? Uh, well, currently I am the managing editor of Covert Action Magazine. Uh, I have a background, yeah, in uh, working in higher education, and uh, yeah, I've researched these kind of gray areas of U.S. foreign policy uh, and, and tried to puncture, you know, certain myths uh, that prevail on uh, the dominant uh, media. Yeah, including uh, with regards to you know political figure like Obama, or I guess the saintly image uh, of Obama. And, you know, I'm currently working on a book on, on Bill Clinton. So uh, these kind of liberal heroes. I guess showing the truth behind them and the hypocrisy uh, and double standard that we see. So, uh, but yeah, uh, check us out. Covert Action Magazine. Uh, you know, the magazine focuses on trying to expose covert action and provide you know critical analysis on U.S. foreign policy. And it was named after a famous CIA whistleblower, uh, Philip Agee, who uh, started the magazine in the late seventies. Yeah, last time we had John, we pretty much focused on uh, how just about every presidency has been run by the CIA. Uh, so that's what we're going to find in the new Clinton book. Yes, uh, I believe Clinton was recruited into the CIA when he was a student at Oxford, yeah. and this was admitted by Cord Meyer Jr., uh, who was a well-known CIA agent. And uh, you know, Clinton uh, was sent on a secret mission because his roommate at Oxford was Strobe Talbot, who, be, who was very high in the State Department when he was president and came from a, a very influential family in Ohio who had connection with high, uh, his uh I believe it was, I have to double check. I think it was his grandfather had been a, a very high in the Pentagon, and he was very well connected in the CIA, uh, probably. And yeah, they were sent to smuggle Nikita Khrushchev's memoirs out of uh, Russia, because uh, that was a boon for the CIA, because Khrushchev had denounced Stalin and you know painted the Soviet Union very negatively, and that's where it started. And then Clinton, the book. But we'll go into the cover-up uh, around the MENA drug trafficking operation in the 80s that was part of the uh, Iran-Contra affair and uh, illicit drug and arms smuggling to Nicaraguan Contras, which took place in Arkansas when Clinton was the governor, and Clinton helped cover that up. So he did services for the agency, and then when he was president, he continued to support. He kind of supported the revitalization of the CIA after the end of the Cold War, You know, and many were saying the CIA should be abolished and, uh, you know, we're calling for uh, scaling. You know, well, Robert McNamara called a peace dividend, but Clinton ended up, you know, expanding the military budgets and mm-hmm. promoting all these humanitarian interventions, uh, as they called them. So the book goes into that. Yeah, crime bill, all that kind of stuff. But but now, does this explain uh, this smuggling of this uh, these memoirs? Does that explain his trip to Moscow? That thing for his honeymoon, I think, right? 
Yeah. Well, no, this was in, uh, before he was married, okay. before he was a student at Yale. Yeah, because he, you know, his family was not wealthy, so everybody wondered how he could afford to travel because he traveled in Eastern Europe and Moscow and with Strobe Talbot, who we pretty much know was CIA. And, and Cordmeyer Jr., though, admitted uh, years later that Clinton had been recruited into the CIA and the CIA paid for that trip. So. Uh, we know pretty well that uh, that's when his relationship with the CIA started, and it's alleged that he was an informant on the anti-war movement, you know, in the Vietnam anti-war movement, and then yeah, we see that relationship pay dividend in the 80s when he supported the Iran-Contra operations from Arkansas as the governor. Before we get to, because uh, the, the topic, of, before we forget, <laughs> the topic of today's show is was the CIA behind the Jonestown Massacre. Uh, but real quick, Covert Action Magazine. Tell us about Covert, Covert Action Magazine and how important it is. I think it's an important magazine because it's the only magazine that's really dedicated to exposing the CIA and the corruption of the deep, deep state and providing good you know, empirical research. I mean, there are a lot, uh, a lot of theories out there. We try and you know, provide evidence and, and, and facts to verify uh, some of those theories. And also, you know, that's focusing on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and the political economic dimensions that underlay a lot of U.S. Uh, military and foreign policy interventions and the impact in wide regions across the globe. So there's no single magazine uh, focusing uh, on that. And, yeah, the magazine was founded in the 70s by Philip Agee, who had served with the CIA in Latin America, and he grew disaffected with the agency's practices. And in fact, he considered it to be a criminal conspiracy, cons conspiracy that they were carrying out criminal activities uh, in these countries he was operating. And, and he witnessed it firsthand that they were violating the law repeatedly, that they were supporting right-wing coups, they were trampling on democracy in those countries, and they were trying to promote the interests of U.S.-based mul multinational corporation at the expense of local businesses and local economy. And he couldn't stomach it. He wrote uh, his memoir inside the company, a CIA diary. And then he was kind of on the run because he started naming na he was naming names. Of course, the CIA wasn't happy at all that he'd written this tell-all expose and accused him of criminal activity and exposed criminal activity. And he also felt it was important to name the name. He felt that these people were criminals and that it was they were traitors to the United States. They had betrayed the U.S. Constitution and they should be called out and held accountable for their crimes. And the CIA had a vendetta against him and he, uh, you know, was chased. Uh, he had to, I think, renounce his passport and he lived in Europe, but he was chased out of a number of countries, and he ended up uh, moving to Cuba to work in the tourism industry for a period. But, yeah, he supported this magazine with journalist Lou Wolf, who had worked in the underground press during the Vietnam War era, and it was devoted to exposing CIA operations and exposing. There was a column naming names that outed CIA agents, although it drew on public records and class, uh, declassified documents. Uh, so it wasn't actually like leaking secret information. It was just uh, promoting, uh, you know, what was known uh, and, and outing CIA agents, uh, <clears throat> many of whom had already been outed. Uh, but yeah, to to expose this to the public, and yeah, it broadened over the years to provide a, you know general critical analysis of U.S. foreign policy, which is yet yeah, urgently needed today, given that the U.S. is. Risk, uh, basically provoking war with Russia and China at the same time as courting you know, potential nuclear world war uh, and spending uh, close to a trillion dollars officially on the military when there are so many uh, major problems at home that need uh, to be addressed and yet all that money is going to the military and we see you know, endless wars and fruitless interventions and more and more people I think now are waking up uh, that something has gone ter terribly awry but I think you know, our magazine can hopefully help edu educate people and build a movement for a change in the direction of U.S. policy and government. Yeah, so people can go to covertactionmagazine.com, and there's several ways you can support. You can donate, you can, you can subscribe, and you can also order hard copies of the back issues. 
and it's not that expensive. Uh, so we invited you back well, last time for some crazy reason. I thought we were going to talk about uh, uh, CIA influence over the presidency and also Jim Jones. I don't know what I was thinking, uh, but uh, you wrote this incredible article in CovertActionMagazine.com. Was the CIA behind the Jonestown massacre? Now, for the younger audience, the kids out there, uh, tell us what was the Jonestown massacre and who was Jim Jones? Okay, well, this was a famous event, yeah, and there are a number of movies that still come out on this event, and almost everybody knows the fa- the phrase, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid, uh, because Joan was this, you know, cult leader who, uh, he was head of this church called the People's Temple, and it brought together, like, many from the counterculture, uh, you know, because he, he started in Indianapolis, but then he moved to California and San Francisco, which was, you know, the heart of the hippie movement in the 60s and into the 70s. And the church had been involved, you know, in, in social protest against the Vietnam War and was supporting, you know, civil rights and other progressive causes. And there were a lot of, it was a very diverse uh, congregation. There were a lot of African Americans. And, you know, Jones presented himself as this kind of racial healer who was bringing together the races. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and then uh, he established, like, a colony in, in Guyana where, you know, the church bought some land and they brought people to Guyana uh, to live in a kind of commune and to cultivate the land and uh, to live, uh, you know, uh, supposedly, you know, live a good life. Uh, you know, doing good deeds and stuff like that, but it turned horribly awry when allegedly you know, he convinced them uh, all to commit mass suicide. But yeah, we can get into the the. There's strong evidence to indicate that that official story not really true. That in, there's some truth. Yes, he was a cult leader and he did manipulate his followers, but many it appeared were actually murdered. Uh, and beneath the surface, yeah, there are a lot of hidden intrigues behind that story that we can get into. Yeah, and fascinating, too, just thinking off the top of my head, that, that we would have recordings of these last words, uh, drink, uh, come for my children, my children, you know, that that, 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 that would even exist, that that would survive uh, such a, uh, an incredible chaotic tragedy uh, to this day that it still exists. Uh, but give us an idea of Jim Jones and his background, his childhood, growing up. What makes him suspicious? Okay, well... Okay, he grew up in, in Indianapolis. Um, his father allegedly was part of the KKK, although that story may have been made up, uh, you know, because he wanted to present this image of himself as somebody like who came from racist family, and now he was promoting the integration of the races and, you know, black rights and stuff. Um, but, um, yeah, he, he was a very uh, smart uh, person, and he was very, very charismatic, and he became a preacher uh, in his home state uh, of Indiana, Indiana and Indianapolis. And, yeah, he was, like, you know, mesmerizing as a preacher, and he could allegedly, you know, heal the sick, and uh, he would have these rituals on stage and even uh, bring back uh, claim to have, uh, you know, brought back the dead, I think, even in a couple cases. Uh, and and apparently, yeah, it was a great spe- spectacle he put on. So he built a huge following for his church. And yeah, even from that time in Indianapolis, he was promoting this image of himself as progressive. And he promoted like a com- communalist philosophy, uh, not communist, but communalism, that, that people should live together. Uh, but he did uh, critique you know, capitalism, and he, he situated himself more on the political left. Uh, but what was suspicious was that, well, firstly, uh, I mean, Indiana and Indianapolis, this is in the 1950s, was you know, a very conservative city, uh, conservative region of the country in, in a conservative era. And then he was seen uh, at some um, communist meetings but where there were a lot of intelligence agents. Um, you know, so there was suspicion from that time uh, because of the evidence that emerged of that, that he may have actually been a, a, an undercover intelligence agent or informant. And, you know, the, the CIA will create, you know, legends if they have uh, for their agents a certain public image that may be at odds with reality. And then was especially suspicious that in the early 60s, he, he uh, spent a period in Brazil and then Guyana. And now in Brazil, he lived in a very wealthy neighborhood. He was in Rio de Janeiro and Belo Horizonte, and he lived in very wealthy neighborhoods. Uh, 
Uh, so if he, if he was just this kind of humble preacher, why was he in a wealthy neighborhood? And the neighbors saw him, you know, he would be picked up in the morning in a fancy car and he would carry a briefcase. And his cover, like he was working by day in a laundromat and doing some, you know, missionary work uh, and another insurance company. But people, uh, like, said he was, I don't know, like, they said he was too shy to make a sale. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, here is this like very gifted, charismatic, manipulative guy, and somehow he's too shy to make a sale, and he's barely ever at that company. So what is he really there for? And it's believed that he was involved. And well, actually, he was outed. He had to leave Brazil because the Brazilian press outed him as a CIA agent, and he was outed as somebody involved in the CIA's operation. To oust Khao Gular, who was like a Lula type, you know, left of center leader who was charting more independent political course for Brazil. Uh, but the U.S. government, CIA, viewed him as too close to the communists. So they mounted a coup against Gular, and that paved the way for 20 years of military rule. And Jones appeared to have been part of that covert operation. Yeah, and, and the one other major suspicious thing was that he would live next to and was close with Dan Mitrione, and the two had gone back, had known each other from their time in Indiana. Mitrione had been police chief in Richmond, Indiana, but Mitrione was known to be a CIA agent who was, uh, worked for the uh, uh, USAID's Office of Public Safety, which was a CIA front operation to train the police and secret police uh, of governments that the U.S. was either propping up in the Cold War or the secret police in government like that of Goulart where they were planning a regime change or a coup and they wanted to cultivate loyalty in the police uh, to carry out the coup or to support the coup. So Mitron was known to be a CIA agent and that was his very close friend and they, they just happened to be together in, in, in Brazil. And then when he went to Guyana, yeah, he forged a close relationship with Forbes Burnham now, in Guyana in the 60s, Guyana achieved its independence from Great Britain, and their first leader was a guy named Chetty Jagan. You know, their division between the Indian and black population in Guyana. And Chetty Jagan was an Indian and a socialist, and the CIA and U.S. government didn't like him, so they applauded a coup against him, and they promoted Forbes Burnham, and, and they claimed to be, you know, for black power, because Fort Burnham was an afro Guyanese, and he promoted, like, black power, but it was very superficial, and really he was he was very corrupt, and when he became president, he basically sold over Guyana's economy to, you know, foreign capitalist interests, and he also allowed for U.S. Uh, military facilities in Guyana, and Joan became very close with, with Burnham, and um, they were stirring racial unrest. You know, they want as like divide and conquer. You know, they were pitting. They wanted to pit the Afro Guyanese against the Indians to facilitate the coup, and that may have been part of Jones' task: is to facilitate racial division and conflict as a precondition for the coup. And that's yeah, his close relationship with Burnham led to Jonestown being set up in Guyana a decade later. And Burnham remained in power, like from the mid six, I think it was 66, the coup, until sometime in the 80s. So, And Jonestown was set up in the late 70s, or, or a bit earlier, mid-70s. So it was that relationship between Jones and Ford Burnham as to why uh, the People's Temple ended up with a huge plot of land in in uh, Jones in, in Guyana, and and the Burnham was involved, I think, in the cover up because he was getting money because of Jonestown, and um, you know the U.S. government aid to to Guyana increased exponentially, uh, especially after Jonestown was there. So that's suspicious too, and yeah, Burnham was clearly part of the cover up. Uh, about what happened, uh, the two men had close relations. So, yeah, you can see in his background that he appeared to have been an agent of the U.S. government, and they, you know, the CIA will create a legend like they did this for Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm -hmm. They created the legend that he was this leftist with a fair play for Cuba committee, and they even staged an arrest so he would be in the newspaper that a fair play for Cuba. But very likely, new evidence is confirming that Oswald was a. Uh, deep cover CIA agents, and that was part of an effort to to create a legend about them. So I think the same thing with Jones, and they may you know Jones played up again this 
image that that he was for you know civil rights and anti Vietnam, uh, and it was a way to to yeah, establish this legend for himself. When all along he was doing the bidding of the of the CIA and the U.S. government, and part of it may have been the whole thing was to discredit the left, like with you know in the counterculture uh, by associating a left wing movement with a figure like Jones, just like with with Charles Manson. There's growing evidence. Mm-hmm. That Charles Manson had connection with the CIA and may have been part of the MK Ultra. There's a book by Tom O'Neill that goes into this, a recent book that's very, very well researched. And so you can see a parallel in the two cases is that they're trying to discredit and destroy, and that would be a project of the CIA. SLA, too, would be another example. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They support these fringe groups and extreme acts of violence, so there's a very negative connotation associated, like with the hippie movement and the counterculture, that it's associated with these cult leaders and deranged and violent groups, when really those movements have been about peace and uh, ending the Vietnam War and, you know, uh, developing a more peaceful society. Yeah, yeah, but before we get too far ahead, uh, I, I did a whole show about Dan Mitrioni uh, with Joseph Green, who's a very well-respected uh, author and researcher. Um, and and, and, and w- at, w- at Mitrioni's funeral, people like Frank Sinatra and Jerry Lewis, it was a huge funeral. Uh, so fascinating uh, connection there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Definitely. Now, what about uh, when, when Jones was in... Uh, uh, San Francisco and and and, uh, and the United States. He had a lot of government funding, a lot of all kinds of foster children kind of deals and, and all kind of stuff going on. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and with the Mitrione, yeah, that would be odd for a small town police chief <laughs> to have all these luminaries at his funeral. Uh-huh. And who knew him? Now, uh, yeah, with Jones, he was connected, like with the, and that, that's the very suspicious thing is that, well, there was a paper by a Berkeley professor who argued and, and had evidence to corroborate that when the Operation MK Ultra, which I think most listeners know about, was a secret unethical drug testing that the CIA was carrying out during the Cold War because they thought that the Chinese had developed the brainwashing techniques in the Korean War and they had to try and match the Chinese and develop ways to get you know prisoners to talk. They did all these kind of unethical drug experiments. Now that was shut down by Congress after the Church Committee and investigation in the mid-70s. But this Berkeley professor's uh, thesis <coughs> with uh, good evidence was that they they moved to cult. The CIA, after it was officially shut down, kept the Operation uh, MK Ultra, but moved it into religious cults. And that would be a good play because cult leaders, you know, manipulate their parishioners so they can get them almost to do anything. And that's where, yeah, relating to your questions, that Jones was connected with these psychiatric institutes uh, in San Francisco, which I can go into in the article. Uh, and there is suspicion and evidence uh, to, you know, I wouldn't say confirm, but to strongly suggest the suspicion is uh, warranted that Jonestown was set up. Uh, that there was a side to the Jonestown colony where they were carrying out MK Ultra type experiments because after the disaster they found all kinds of drugs that were reused in MK Ultra before like Thorazine and uh, sedatives and different kinds of drugs uh, there are huge huge amount of drugs found at the facility so what were those drugs doing there and they had also used things like sensory deprivation you know, to punish people for any disciplinary infractions they use methods like that the CIA is known to use or has experimented with like sensory deprivation uh, or isolation uh, so that was known to have occurred there so uh, that lends suspicion to the uh, belief that that Jonestown was there were experiments going on associated with a successor to MK Ultra, and Jones was overseeing that. And again, there was a relationship with these psychiatric uh, institutes uh, between the People's Temple and Jones himself, and they recruited uh, personnel from those facilities. Uh, yeah, and one of those I guess you could call it small world. Uh, <laughs> if you want to call it small world. Uh, 
uh, is that O.J. Simpson's mother worked at one of those psych wards. Uh, you know, take take that as you want. <laughs> okay. Interesting. And, and back to Dan Mitrioni, uh, his specialty was torture. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, he would uh, allegedly, according to, I think, some of the students and, and uh, defectors and, and some Cuban sources, yeah, he would take beggars off the street in yeah. Brazil and – uh, you know, tortured them in front of the police recruits, and his motto was the right pain, the right place, at the right time. And in a few cases, it was said that the recruit didn't survive these tortures. He tortured people to death uh, in front of like students. So he was a, a sadistic individual. Yeah, life is worthless to these people. Mm-hmm. Now, um, the main focus here, though is that this was not a main of your article here in covertactionmagazine.com uh, titled, uh, Was the CIA Behind the Jonestown Massacre? Was this a mass suicide or was this uh, uh, homicide? A mass homicide? Well, there's uh, very strong evidence uh, that it was a mass homicide. Uh, the I think uh, the Guyanese government sent a, a forensic investigator, Leslie Mutu, and he he concluded there were at least 700 homicides. Uh, Louis Gurevich was ran the largest detective agency in New Orleans, and his daughter tragically died. And he carried out his own investigation, and he found evidence yeah, that people had been, and this was similar to Mutu, that people had been injected with poison in the back in places where they couldn't been couldn't have been injected by themselves. Somebody had to have injected them. There were evidence of struggle in the bodies. Uh, both found evidence the bodies had been moved, that some people had been you know, dragged to death and then laid out to make it look like a you know, neat crime scene. Um, there were uh, evidence of gunshots, uh, uh, and there was, yeah, again, evidence of struggle and fighting. So it looks like you know somebody poisoned them in the back, injected them forcibly with poison in the back, and some struggled, tried to fight off their attacker. Uh, so the, the crime scene evidence was, was pretty clear that this was a mass homicide and not a mass suicide, as is the popular uh, impression. And not only that, it was very odd, too, because I remember, I'm old enough to remember watching this on TV live as it was going on, and it was horrific, you know, this was horrific. Uh, We wouldn't have 24-hour news back in those days, but just just the, the, the... the news would dominate by this. And first they would say, oh, there's 300 deaths. And then they would start finding bodies piled upon each other, that the parents were piled upon their children. And that was their excuse of why these numbers just suddenly tripled. Yeah, and there's no explanation for why the bodies, uh, you know, unless they were placed in that way, because yeah. why would they be on top of each other? Uh, but again, the, the crime scene evidence indicated a uh, struggle and, and, and that there yeah, had been uh, injected forcibly in the back and that there were shoot, numerous shootings. Uh, so, And then there's so many uh, suspicious things, including that the CIA, somehow the Guyanese authorities were only alerted the next morning because this occurred uh, sometime in the night. But somehow the CIA informed the Defense Department at like 3 a.m., uh, about that, that there had been uh, something terrible. So, how would the CIA know about that if Guyanese authorities hadn't even been alerted yet and hadn't gone on the scene, unless there were CIA, you know, Joan was CIA or there were CIA agents there? And yeah, these tape recording you mentioned, there was a surviving tape recording where it said, you know, Joan was uh, heard saying, you know, get Dwyer out of there. Right. Uh, we don't want him to get hurt. And Dwyer was Richard Dwyer was at the U.S. Embassy, who was a suspected CIA agent. And you know what was he doing there, and why did they have to get him out of there? Um, it, yeah, what was he doing there, and how did he get out of there? Uh, which brings me to Mark Lane. I know Mark Lane is a hero uh, in the JFK. Uh, research, but uh, he was down there, and uh, I've talked, I've interviewed people that were down there that escaped, who were kept on the tarmac in the United States. When they landed in the United States, they were kept on that plane for 13 hours plus. I don't know the exact number, but it was a, a but Mark Lane somehow had a private plane taken back and uh, was able to just walk an, away. Uh, what do you make of that? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think Mark Lane was representing the People's Temple. 10000 a month. A lawyer. 
and he may have been lured to Jonestown and it may have been part of a setup to discredit him because he was a leading JFK assassination researcher and they, if they can smear him and link him with the People's Temple uh, and this cult that, that caused people to commit mass suicide that's a way to discredit him and his finding about the JFK assassination which was still I think at that time you know very very controversial and he was really at the cutting edge of that research so they wanted to find a way of discrediting him uh, so they could link him with the temple. I think they they kind of again lured him. I mean, there were a lot of leftists or you know progressives or, or do gooder types who were attracted to the temple and its message uh, again of unity. And I mean, it was it was supporting a lot of progressive social causes. And, and Jim Jones had a reputation, even like you know Martin. He was given like a major award, yeah. humanitarian award. So you can't necessarily fault somebody for for. Uh, being, you know, wanting being their lawyer. I mean, I don't think uh, Lane necessarily did anything wrong. I think, like others, he you know, felt that it was a good organization. That was at least the public impression of them uh, until this. I mean, there were darker things uh, that emerged later about Joan, but I don't think that was well known at the time. Uh, so, I don't know if if there's anything bad that he did. It may, it could be. I, I don't know the. Maybe I don't know the full story. I mean, there are a lot of intrigues here. So yeah, I, there may be something bad. I don't know. From my <laughs> reading, he was just kind of lured, and he was. Uh, it was a way to smear him to associate with this group, but he somehow got out. But maybe there's more to that story. I don't know about. Yeah, I always say if I write a book, it's going to be the more I learn, the less I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can interview a hundred people, man. You know, like like I've, I've interviewed a couple of survivors from. Jonestown, and, and one says, oh, yeah, this was a, a previously, this was a CIA training ground, and another one says, no, when we got there, there was nothing. There was no roads. There was nothing. Do you know anything about that? Well, I think there may, firstly, there may have been, it was a huge property, right. and even some people may not have known that there were things going on on other ends of the property. Like, it was rumored uh, and there seems to be some evidence to suggest this, that they were training mercenaries. Even before a lot of the parishioners came, uh, that they were training mercenaries, and there was a paramilitary camp uh, on some you know, end of the property, and they were training mercenaries who were being sent to Angola, where the CIA was involved in the covert operation to unseat the uh, left-wing government that came in after the Portuguese rule. Um now, people, because I, I met somebody who was in the People's Temple, and, you know, she was kind of defending the, the People's Temple, right. and she said, oh, none of this went on, and, and well, she wasn't in Guyana, she was in Berkeley, but she knew people there, but I said, they may not have known, it could have happened, but they, they may, they probably wouldn't have known, because it was, it was, again, a huge property. Now, as far and things are going on uh, in, in in a remote area that they wouldn't have known about, like this mercenary training, and then the MK Ultra. Well, I mean, observers did uh, notice that people in the people you know who were in in Jonestown looked like zombies, and they looked to be heavily drugged. So that's uh, suspicious. And also, too, I'm sure there's portions of the property that just weren't allowed. You know, they, yeah, exactly. they obeyed. And there may have been a lot of normal activities. And then this was going on in, in just right. parts of it. So the average of certain people wouldn't know that that was going on. Uh, scrolling down your article, I noticed that uh, you mentioned Dr. Richard Offshe, who's from the false memory syndrome. How does he fit into all this? Um, let me, uh, Richard Offshe. See, I, yeah, there's so many yeah. detailed <laughs> layers. I, I can't remember everything about the story. Okay, we, we don't need to, we don't need to get into I, that. I wrote I wrote it about uh, a year ago, but I, him I can't remember. You'd have to remind me about him. Okay, we can move on. Um, now, how about this? Right around the same time, there were other murders that went on in San Francisco. One of them was Mayor Moscone. Now, how close was that? Was like days, right? Yeah, I was. That that came a few days after, and I yeah. I was starting to look into that, and was thinking about doing an article about that case. Uh, that I haven't yet accumulated enough uh, information. I move on to other topics in the interim, but yeah, well, there is an excellent book for listeners. I can highly recommend Michael Myers. Okay. I don't know if he's still alive, but he, uh, he hopefully he's still alive. He did a tremendous study 
of Jonestown called Was Jonestown a Religious Experiment, where he really goes into the MK Ultra. And the article I did in Covert Action Magazine draws quite a lot on, on, on his uh, study. And he does forge a connection between the Moscone and Harvey Milk killings. Um, and what was suspicious was yeah, the, the killer whose name I forget, was this, uh, allegedly this, this disgruntled city councilman. Right. Uh, but there is some evidence he could have been part of these mind control experiments. Uh, There's some really odd behavior uh, and odd things in that case that would lend to suspicion that that could have been a, a political assassination. Yeah, uh, just just yes. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Just just recently, I interviewed the fellow just by coincidence, uh, who got his confession, and it turns out that they were very close friends. Okay, uh, <laughs> took his confession. Uh, the cop that took his confession. Uh, uh, people should go back and look at look at that interview. I think it was foul zone. I'll have to. Uh, I'll put, I'll put a note in the comments. Now uh, another point of your article here. The excellent article, by the way. I, I totally recommend this. It's called, once again, uh, uh, Was the CIA Behind the Jonestown Massacre? We're talking to Jeremy Kuzmarov. You could K-U-Z M-A-R-O-V and you go to JeremyKuzmarov.com One of your uh, things you point out here is that possibly Jones escaped alive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see off. Yeah. I was actually referencing. I just forgotten his name. Sure. This was this Berkeley professor who wrote this paper that yeah, listeners can look up. It's called the Penal Colony, and he was the one advancing the thesis that MK Ultra, after it was officially shut down, moved into religious cults, and that Jonestown was uh, a paramount case of that. So he's a, a very good researcher uh, who's worth looking up. As far as Jonestown. Um, uh, it's our Jones and whether he survived. Yeah, there, there's, there's, it looks to be that way because there was somebody who looked like Jones who they found dead, but they said, oh, he's dead. Look, but actually, when they looked more carefully at the body, you know, there were tattoos that made it clear that that was not Jones. Really. And then supposedly he committed suicide, but the gun was found uh, too far away. You know, if after you shoot yourself, you can't throw a gun. <laughs> Uh, it would be right next to you. So uh, it looked like that was stayed. They kind of staged a double, and the CIA uses doubles. And so that's a possibility that they created a double, or there was somebody who looked like Jones who was killed, um, but it's clear it wasn't Jones. So his body was never found, and he would have had a lot of connections that lead you know, people, some researchers to believe that he could have escaped to Brazil. There, there are people who did get away, and he could have been one of them who went to Brazil. Uh, people got away by boat, and he he could have. It, it's a good chance he got away and lived uh, under you know uh, cover. Yeah, one of the survivors even claimed that uh, there, there were his passports were at two different locations at the same time. Like, like they were two Jim Jones with two Jim Jones passwords in different countries at the same time. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I read that. Yeah, yeah. see, there are a number of good researchers. One is, um, I think, Jim Hoogan, who has written some good uh, analysis of Watergate and how that was a coup d'etat game Nixon. He did an important article on this topic, and he had some good uh, information and insights about that, as well as Michael Myers. And there are a couple other, uh, you know, off she So there, there's some really good, good research uh, has been done on this topic for anybody uh, who's interested in looking into it more. And yeah, that that is something they found that would indicate, you know, CIA. If there are two passports, uh, that's a you know trademark of the CIA, uh, and they're they're creating doubles for him, and it's all part of an intelligence operation. Now, now, what about Leo Ryan? I know his aide was convinced that there, there was a conspiracy. Yeah, Leo Ryan very important to the story because they lured him, possibly like Lane, I was saying, although yeah, we're not sure the full story about Lane. But with Leo Ryan, we know that he was lured to Jonestown. Now, Leo Ryan was the leading congressional critic of the CIA, and he still he may be the only congressman to have been assassinated while serving in the Congress. And his aide, Jackie Spear, was wounded, uh, although she survived, and I believe she's still in the U.S. Congress. Uh, but he, yeah, so he had, he had sponsored the Hughes-Ryan Amendment, 
which this came around the time of the church committee, which had exposed abuse of the CIA. And you know, the, the Hughes-Ryan Amendment was a major bill that would uh, basically make it very difficult for the CIA to carry covert operation. And it had to be much greater congressional scrutiny and you know, congressional approval. And it was really going to rein in the CIA and you know, covert paramilitary arm of the CIA. So the CIA hated him. And he was lured to Jonestown. Apparently, his daughter had uh, been involved in, like religious cult in Oregon, so he had an interest in cults. And they lured him there, and he carried out an investigation. You know, there, there had also been all kinds of stories, like the local media uh, started publicizing stories like corruption with Jones, and there were some suspicious deaths of people's temple members. Uh, who there was suspicion that Joan may have been behind the killing. Now, this woman I met from the People's Temple dismissed these uh, media investigation and, and exposés as kind of yellow journalism, and that was the Rupert Mur even one of the newspapers she said was owned by Rupert Murdoch, and they hated him because he was Jones on the left. So that that was her. But I, I think there were some you know serious uh, you know criminal activity that. Uh, Joan was involved, and in, even with regard to lo money laundering and, and these suspicious deaths. Uh, so, you know, and that was in Ryan's district, so it, it was in many ways his responsibility to investigate the People's Temple and these allegations of corruption, criminality, and even murder. And so, yeah, he went to Jonestown, and then he was assassinated. And it looked to be a professional assassination. It wasn't actually anybody from Jonestown. It was like professional, a professional military operation. And there's a photo of some guy in army fatigues um, who looked like a Green Beret. And so, so, so Ryan was assassinated. Uh, and that was, I think, you know, important to this whole story. And that could have been one of the motives behind the whole thing, the way to get rid of the major congressional critic of the CIA, and and then what? And then they clean up the camp by by killing everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean there may have been several agendas at play, so that was one of them. And then there, I guess, other agendas maybe to cover because Ryan maybe was it going to expose the the what Offshe wrote about in his paper, the Operation MK Ultra, and the mercenary training, and the criminal activities of Jones and the CIA in all this, and other things. You know, they were manipulating people um, and brain. And they were you know really unethical medical experiments. Mm that were going on here uh, and even you know some targeting the black population you know, I think Meyer presents it as almost like an ex extension of the Tuskegee experiment where they were like experimenting on because there were a lot of African Americans in the people's temple and uh, it was in some way an extension of the Tuskegee Institute where they're carrying out like an unethical medical experiment that not far removed from you know Mengele and, and the Nazis did on Jews so uh, so this was so horrible that uh, the expose would be devastating. So mm -hmm. uh, you can tie all that together, and there is a, a clear motive uh, for the the homicides um, if that all lines up. And then there, you know, there's the the Leighton family was um, in another important angle is that uh, a big financier and supporter of the People's Temple was this yeah the Leighton family, and the patriarch Lawrence Leighton had been the head of the U.S. Army Chemical Warfare Branch, uh, the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah, and uh, he was also been you know supportive of a lot of covert uh, experimentation and weapons development. Uh, so um, he may have been tied in with all this, and again these uh, illegal and unethical experiments that may they may have been doing related to military operations and, and, and the CIA and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a photo of Larry Lane, and he appears to be in custody. Anything happened to him? Yeah, that's his son. He was the only one who was ever arrested. Yeah. He was he was charged with the murder of Leo Ryan, but yeah, he they said he looked like a zombie, and this would, I think, be evidence of MK Ultra that he was a victim uh, because he looked like a zombie, and it was like an out-of-body experience when he was arrested. So he could have been 
program to to participate in this. Although I, I don't think he was actually the shooter um, because it was a professional military hit, and there's uh, images of one image of a, a guy in military fatigues, a tall man in military fatigues, who appeared to be the real shooter. So Larry could have been a, a patsy. Uh, who had been drugged and programmed like a Sirhan Sirhan and he was some kind of decoy or something in this professional hit but yeah he did go to jail I don't know if he's still alive or what happened to him I, I, I'd have to look that up yeah it's very interesting because there's recordings of Joan's son ordering tortures you know but uh, for some reason he was off on some basketball <laughs> game <laughs> basketball tournament with 13 other guys uh, when all this went down I tell you when you look back at this story it is just so damn ridiculous yeah I mean it's really twisted I mean, <laughs> and I mean you know I mean how could they be so evil that they were doing this you know the, the way they manipulated people I mean it's bad enough when you read some accounts of people who are in the people's temple they they discuss some of the sick games that Jones would play in the church itself like in, in San Francisco and even he would force people to, like have sex on the stage and you know he would force many women to have sex with him women as well as men and I mean that's kind of sick enough what he was doing he developed files on everybody and that's another indication that he was probably CIA that they, he developed like a very sophisticated filing system so he could monitor you know every and know everything about everybody in the people's temple and he could use it for blackmailing purpose and he would even trick them into signing their names like he would have them sign their name on a blank paper and then it would insert you know that they had committed all these crimes so if they were ever going to leak any information, they would say, oh, look, you've admitted to all these crimes, you're going to go to jail, uh, you better keep quiet. Uh, so, I mean, just the, the level of manipulation within the church, and then, yeah, if you get into what we've been discussing, that they're performing sick medical experiments, uh, and then they would just murder all these people uh, to prevent exposure, it's, it's a horrifying uh, story uh, overall. I mean, it's bad enough to think that people might be led into a mass suicide, yeah. But that's almost kind of tame when the real story starts to emerge, and, and the level of manipulation is just uh, unbelievable. Yeah, people, the audience should go back to the archives and look up uh, the White House Boys, the Dozier School for Boys here in Florida, uh, where it was a, a school for orphans and young boys and stuff like that. But they didn't have clothes. They didn't have proper food. They, they were being worked half to death. But they had medical equipment down there, and these kids were being uh, examined on a regular basis uh, with high. They couldn't believe the high tech equipment uh, that they were being uh, examined with. So, uh, this is not all that far fetched. Now, let's see. We won't, we've only got about five minutes left. Uh, is there anything I haven't asked you that's really important you want the audience to know? Uh, but I think we've covered it pretty well. I, I think, yeah, the other angle of this is that. You know, as part of the manipulation is that the, the 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 level of manipulation the CIA would go to to you know try and alter American politics and try and discredit the '60s movements uh, by again trying to associate them with Joan and that they went like lemmings to their death uh, to this cult leader. I think it was all a fabricated story, and this was set up by the by the CIA as part of their political agenda of discrediting. The political left. Uh, so, in a way, it's kind of clever, but the, 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 the sadistic minds in that agency and a lack of regard for human life, as you were pointing out, like a Mitrione who would torture people yeah. uh, in front of other people, you know, it's, it's sad uh, that uh, these people exist. That, you know, people are so diabolical and they're in, in powerful positions in society. And sadly, we see that continuously in the present day. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily give you confidence in, in the human species when you get into these kind of stories, but it is the reality. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, with Ryan, his, his aide, Joe Holsinger, uh, at the end of my article, yeah, I quote his son, like, right. I mean... You know, I mean, this kind of the true the true story in history is really buried and known only to a small number of people who've really dug into it. And I think the public at large has been kept in the dark. 
and there's still these movies that present the uh, myth, uh, mythic story of people uh, committing mass suicide. But yeah, William Holsinger, the son, you know, according to the end of the article, he said whether there was some broader conspiracy and what it might have consisted of or matters I've determined to leave to future generations. And I think even he, and, th and this was at the 30th anniversary of Jonestown, so there was a reluctance to even investigate this even you know, decades later uh, and to grapple with the, the truth of what, what was behind all this. And again, I think it's because the CIA is still so powerful yeah. that nobody wants to challenge them and call them out for, for something as horrible as this. Yeah, there's always a TV movie with the official story. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, you know, this whole thing with Stormy Daniels, you know, I know all those people involved in that whole story. Uh, and I'll try and explain to people what, what, what really went on. And I say, oh, but no, I watched something on TV. <laughs> Let me tell you what I think. You know, okay, yeah. whatever. You know? I've had that too, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you do, man. Yeah. Um, and also the other one too is I just did a show about the, the, the Hotel Scarface, uh, the mutiny uh, club in, uh, it was the, uh, the club in that movie, Scarface, you know. And, and, and all of the CIA, all the CIA, Mitch Warbell hung out there. E. Howard Hunt hung out there. Jeb Bush with this big stupid mustache was hanging out at this place uh, that you see in the movie Scarface where all that action was going on. <sighs> Jeremy Kazmarov, go to jeremykazmarov.com. Also, you can find him too at covertactionmagazine.com uh, where you can support. You can support either by donating subscribing or ordering the back issues which i can't encourage people enough there's so much disinfo out there there's so many characters out there that get all their information from google and then they bought a microphone they go on the air they repeat a bunch of crap that they googled which is controlled by the same folks okay let's face it uh, so let's try and get some some support to the real people out there uh, mr uh, uh, jeremy kazmarov and covertactionmagazine.com Thank you. Yeah, and we can use, uh, you know, if you have story ideas or we'd love, you know, an article on what you're saying, the Stormy Daniel, the real story, I'd love to know that. <laughs> and we'd love to have more articles uh, on these kind of topics. So if you have a story you'd like to tell, you can write for us. My email is jkuzmarov2 at gmail.com. Uh, I'll send you what I got on the Hunter Biden laptop, too, because believe it or not, they're connected. <laughs> okay. <Right. laughs> All right, bro. In fact, I'll send it to you right after the show. Jeremy, okay. thank you so much. Listen, anything comes up. You got a recipe book you want to tell us about, <laughs> give, give us a call. We'll put you right on the show. Okay, my friend? Okay. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care.